We're talking about Mr. Scott himself, actor James Doohan. This is episode 18. Listening to 70s Trek with Bob Turner and Kelly Casco, the fan podcast that looks at Star Trek in the 1970s. It was the decade that built a franchise. Welcome to 70s Trek. This week, we look at the man who played one of Trek's most endearing characters. First of all, we're talking about Mr. Scott and the actor, James Doohan. I'm Bob Turner. And I'm Kelly Casco. Jimmy Doohan's portrayal of Scotty won him the love of millions of fans. He's one of my favorite characters that we talked about. Um, And that's mainly because of his performance of Scotty. Yeah, I love how he played Scotty. He was a bit of a no-nonsense tough guy with a really soft heart for those he cared about. Especially his little barons or his babies, the Enterprise engines. Me barons. Yes. Before we talk about Jimmy Doohan, though, I'll remind everyone how they can find us. Just go out to our Facebook page. It's at facebook.com slash 70s Trek. While you're there, you're welcome to leave us a comment or a question. We would love to hear your memories of Star Trek in the 1970s. You can also find us, of course, on iTunes. Just search 70s Trek in the podcast area. When you find it, please consider leaving us a rating or a review. It'll help others find our show easier. So, so come on. Who's going to say it? Are you going to say it or should say, I say it? Say what? Come on. We're talking about James Doohan and Mr. Uh, Scott. Uh, One of us you, has to say it. Okay, fine. Beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> You know, in the first few years after Star Trek went off the air, like any year, we lost some notable celebrities, uh, though, like Harold Lloyd, Audie Murphy, Louis Armstrong, Janis Joplin, and, of course, one of our favorites from college, Kelly, Jim Morrison. Sad. Got a tear. But we gained some great performers in the 70s as well. Those that were born in 70, 71, 72 included... Tina Fey, Julie Bowen, Nick Offerman, and Trek alumni Will Wheaton, Winona Ryder, and the second actor to play Chief Engineer Montgomery Scott, and, and of course, another favorite of mine, Simon Pegg. Isn't that cool? Simon Pegg was born then. But it's the first actor who played Mr. Scott that we're going to talk about today, actor James Doohan. Kelly... You said before, and you said it at the top, this is one of your favorite characters, one of your favorite actors. Why don't we just spend a couple of seconds here talking about some of our favorite Mr. Scott moments. Do you have one or two or seven, eight? Well, I have one that kind of gets rolled up into about 20 different uh, occurrences. It's, It's his lack of estimating correctly. Yeah, that's going to take two weeks, Captain. <laughs> I need it in three hours. I, I, I'll get it done. <laughs> two hours later, it's done, Captain. Right. So we play the um, technical field. You know, we have a Scotty moment all the time. We we un- overestimate and, and deliver way ahead of schedule. Wow, oh, that's good. That's good. I've got a couple of... Uh, very specific instances that I really, um, when I think of Mr. Scott, these pop into my mind. The first was uh, during the episode of Taste of Armageddon. You know, Scotty is in command, and yep. he knows that there are problems going on on the on the planet surface with the crew. If you remember, that's the one where they're having the computer war, and the Enterprise has been targeted. And Mr. Scott finds a way to help his crew out without um, without breaking the Prime Directive. But he's a very strong character in that, too, because uh, they're telling him, come on, we want you to lower your, you know, your shields and beam your people down here. And he's like, nope, I will not 
lower my screens. Yep. Very strong. Of course, my second favorite moment is Probably in a trouble with tribbles, you know? <laughs> Yep. And, and we've talked about this one, I think, <clears throat> where they're, uh, they've had the bar fight and they're lined up in front of Kirk and Kirk's kind of reading them the right act and he lets everyone else go. And Scotty, you know, Scotty tells him who started the fight. That's a great scene. That's yeah, a very awesome. good scene. But perhaps my favorite scene is from the episode by any other name. When Scotty drinks that Kelvin, I think his name was Tomar. He drinks them yeah. under the table. That's funny. And they turn and they're looking around for, for more booze. <laughs> <laughs> and Scotty pulls out the bottle and they're like, what is it? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's green. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. That's just great stuff. And, and doing, you know, he played it perfectly. He played it perfectly. You know, you looked into uh, Jimmy and his life before it was on Star Trek. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So I'll start off at the beginning, of course. The beginning. He was born March 3rd, 1920 in Vancouver, Canada, not Scotland. Uh, he was born, his parents were Irish immigrants to Canada. Uh, he was the youngest of four and he had a, an aptitude, actually, f- for math and science. In 1938, he enlisted in the Royal Canadian Army. When World War II broke out, he went into the Artillery Corps. Uh, there, he rose to the rank of sergeant and won a place at the officer training school, becoming a lieutenant in the 13th Field Artillery Regiment, uh, later promoted to captain. Really, when he started to see action was D-Day, he led 120 men on June 6, 1944, uh, to help take Juneau Beach in Normandy. Wow. Yeah. Uh, now, why he was there, they took up a defensive position uh, for the night, and he was crossing between command posts, uh, and he was hit by six rounds. It was Canadian sentries that hit him. Four got him in the leg, one in the chest, and I'll come right back to that, and one right through the middle finger, which later had to be amputated. So it was friendly fire? He got hit by his own guys? Yeah. Oh, yes. man. Now, the, the one that hit him in the chest, now, who can say this, that smoking saved his life? He, he was given a silver cigarette case by his brother, and that actually stopped the bullet that went to his chest. Otherwise, really? he'd be dead. Really? Yes. Wow. His uh, middle finger, right middle finger. Sometimes people wish I had my middle finger gone, but um, was amputated. And they all through his career. I mean, you go back and look. Had you ever noticed that he was missing a finger? You know, Did there it? there are moments where I thought I noticed it, but I thought maybe he had, had his finger curled underneath or something. But now that you're telling me, now it's clicking into place. So, oh, yeah, I guess... You must have had it amputated. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. yeah so kind of, kind of crazy. I, I didn't, I, I didn't even know that. So I learned something during my research here. Uh, so after he convalesced, you know, in England, he became a pilot uh, and was part of the air observation posts. Um, and this is like early forty-five. Uh, there he. He was flying these airplanes uh, for the Royal Canadian Air Force, um, and the jo- their job is to fly these low-level missions to photograph, photograph enemy positions to help direct artillery fire. Hmm. Now, now, he never flew in battle, uh, but he did, <laughs> he did get labeled as – the craziest pilot in the Canadian Air Force. Now, he wasn't officially in the Canadian Air Force, but after the war, he moved to London, Ontario to further his technical education. There, he was listening to a radio drama, and he, he's thinking, I can do better than this. So Seri- what does he get? Seriously? <laughs> yes. 
So, so what does he do? He goes down to the local radio station to record his voice. Mr. Just to Mr. prove it. Mr. Scott getting cocky. Yes, he is. That led him to the Tr- Toronto Drama School. Uh, and then furthermore, he won a two-year scholarship to the Neighborhood Playhouse in New York City. All because well, he got all because he heard a radio show and he thought he could yep. do better. Yep. All so that's good. that's what really got his career started. That oh was his big break. God. So some of his uh, classmates at the Neighborhood Playhouse included Leslie Nielsen, Tony Randall, and Richard Boone. Really? Yeah. Rubbing shoulders with some big big wigs. Yeah. Really. That's cool. Yep. Uh, January started January 1946 is when he really started um, his career. And he he has said that he estimated he performed in four thousand radio programs, four hundred and fifty television programs, uh, and, and this is all due to his reputation for versatility. And when you say versatility, you're really talking about the different accents that he can do and his the different way he uses his voice. Is that right? Exactly, exactly. He's uh, an interview he did for a British. Um, talk show back in late seventies, he, he said that all he had to do is listen just for a little bit to, to an, somebody with an accent and he could pick it right up. Wow. So he's just got that weird ability. Exactly. Hmm. Uh, 19 move on to 1950. This is a little bit of weird facts. He starred in, um, well not starred. He was part of, I'll just back up. Sorry. He appeared as forest ranger, timber, Tom, try to say timber, Tom, it's <laughs> tough. Uh, in the Canadian version of happy duty at the same time, William Shatner's appearing as ranger bill in the American version. They also both appeared in the Canadian science fiction series, space command. <laughs> That's awesome. That's just fun to say, too. That's awesome. Uh, just hitting some highlights of his uh, career up before um, Star Trek. He played in several episodes of Hawkeye and The Last of the Mohicans. He was he did several things for GM Presents. Uh, one thing in particular, he played the lead role in uh, 1956 in the CBC TV drama, Flight Into Danger. Hmm. Hazel, Outer Limits, we know Outer Limits, The Fugitive, Bewitched. And did, Man- did, did he appear in The Lieutenant, Roddenberry he, Show? Yep, he was in The Lieutenant. He was. Yes. Okay. It's yep. so interesting how many Trek actors, you know, Roddenberry saw on The Lieutenant first. Oh, it was crazy. Um, he was in The Man from Uncle. Uh, Bonanza, of course, he had to be in Bonanza. He also he co-starred with um, Major Barrett on Bonanza. On Bonanza, yes. Well, it seems like everybody had to be on Bonanza, right? <laughs> he played an assistant to the United States president in two episodes of Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. Oh, geez. And that kind of leads you up to Star Trek. And of course, he was not uh, in the cage but did have a part in Where No Man Has Gone Before. Correct. Not the chief engineer, though, was he? No. No, no. Dead silent there. Sorry. Edit, (laughs) edit. Uh, (laughs) Why, no, Bob. He wasn't. (laughs) He was not. (laughs) I'm sorry. I didn't mean to stump Kelly. Let's play Stump Kelly. Thank you. I think they want to play. Keep your shirt on in the back. Okay. All right. Sorry. All right. So he's talking to Gene Roddenberry as he, they're talking about this character. Uh, and if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, he came up with the name Montgomery Scott. Um, but he also did several readings in different accents. Gene says, well, which accent do you prefer? What do you, how, what do you see this, this engineer ca- character? He goes, well, if he's an engineer, he's got to be Scottish. They have all the best engineers. 
they did at, at, at one time have sort of a reputation for uh, very, very good engineers. I mean, it, when you think about the steamships and the shipping line, and, and a lot of engineers came out of Scotland that were perfect, perfecting transportation in the early part of the 20th century. So I think that's where that reputation comes from. You know, when Star Trek ended, a lot of these guys were looking for work right away. And what would they do? They would turn to other shows. Uh, Jimmy turned to a show called Then Came Bronson, which was um, in 1969. And, and he did a couple episodes of Daniel Boone. Roddenberry was writing a, a, a movie called Pretty Maids All in a Row. And Jimmy had a, a small role in that. Um, he did a couple of episodes of Marcus Welby. He uh, did an episode of Return to Peyton Place. <laughs> you know, I, I imagine it was take what you can get. It seems like that's what he was doing between 69 and 73. And then along came Star Trek, the animated series. Yes. And uh, he really took advantage of that opportunity. He not only voiced Mr. Scott, but he also provided the voice for Lieutenant Eric's. If you remember, there was an orange guy with a third arm sticking out of his check, uh, chest that we never really knew where he came from. Lieutenant Eric's. Yeah. Well, Jimmy Doohan uh, was the voice for him, as well as many, many other guest characters. If you watch the series and you listen, you'll hear his voice. You'll hear... <laughs> Once you start listening for it, you hear it pretty easily, actually. There was one episode, Yesteryear, pretty well-known episode, where he voiced up to seven characters. That's incredible. I'm, I'm sitting here counting, and it's, it is crazy the number it, in the neighborhood of almost forty different characters he voiced. Yes, of course. Working on the animated series, he was all about doing the extra voice work because it was more money. Exactly. So sure, you need me to do an alien from another world. I'll do that. Sure, you yep. need me to do Eric's. I don't know who Eric's is. I'll do that. So go figure. Yeah. That, I, I, I forgot to bring it up, but he did a little bit of that in Star Trek, too, the, the original series. He did voice work in Star Trek as well? Yeah, Sargon, Return to Tomorrow. He did the M5. He was Sargon? Yes. Oh, now. And I'm hearing it in my head, and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, all right, I could see that. Yep. Wow. Well, good for him. I didn't know that he did a lot of that other voice work, but that makes a lot of sense that he would have. That makes a lot of sense. That sort of kept him busy in the early 70s. Uh, he's not real busy after the animated series. Um, there's a reason for that, though. What because, is that reason? Well, as we know, in 1975, Gene Roddenberry was asked to return to Paramount to begin work on a possible Star Trek project, a TV show or a series or a movie, whatever that might be. I said TV show or series. That was sort of dumb. Anyway, he begins working on a new Star Trek project. As that Trek project got closer, what they started doing was signing the actors. So they made sure they had them locked up. Sometimes that was uh, a sign to pay. They would get paid just for signing on the line. So... There was, there was a period in the middle 70s where they, the actors didn't have to work. They were being paid, and they were being paid to appear on this future Star Trek project. So that wasn't a bad gig. No. There is on YouTube, uh, in a, I think it's five or six parts, um, an episode from the show Tomorrow with Tom Snyder, and we've talked about that before. Right. And uh, on that show was... Jimmy Doohan, DeForest Kelly, and Walter Koenig. They're the only actors from the original series that showed up. But uh, Jimmy has a few um, quotes and observations in here that I thought were great. And I just wanted to, um, to share them because it sort, of, it sort of gives you an idea where his head was you know, in the middle 70s. He said that the reason the show was resurging in popularity in 75, 76... Uh, was because they were just good shows. They were just good shows. They were good entertainment, and they had, these are his words, 
absolutely beautiful writing. Uh, he says, quote, it was, a, it was really a beautiful thing. You can now look at it and say, wow, what a great show. Because it had something for every age. And, you know, I, I think I made that observation once for myself that as a kid, I was attracted to the starships and the ray guns. As I grew up into high school and college, I was intrigued by the moral stories and the messages. So it does. That show does have something for everybody in it. He, uh, he also talked about being typecast, something that this cast absolutely experienced through the 70s. A lot of them, a lot of them had a hard time finding jobs. But I think Jimmy did in particular because, um, well, here's what he says. Oh, yeah, no doubt about it, because I've had producers that I worked for before Star Trek say to, to my agent now, quote, well, you know, I don't want a Scotsman. <laughs> Right. He's not Scottish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he'd worked for them for maybe, you know, doing a German voice or, or, or French accent or, you know, Welsh or something like that. But he, you know, but they had Scotty stuck in their head and they couldn't get past it. We well, don't want I- a Scotsman. That's ironic, way. isn't it? I mean, he, he is so versatile and, and can do so many different, um, you know, voice I yes. Can't, I, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, not only and, voice, but but accent. Yes. He was accent, very, yes, very yes. Uh, versatile. You're right. Yeah. And he doesn't get a job because he's considered Scottish. Just Scott. That's all you can do. Oh, man. So that, that interview I saw, he, he talked about being typecast. And he says, I knew the second I walked into doing um, an audition, when they called me Scotty or Mr. Scott, oh, man. Uh, that I, w- I was done. I wasn't getting it. Oh, man. Can you imagine being in there to play a different role and they call you by Mr. Scott? That's tough. On future Star Trek projects, he said this. We're going to be doing a feature motion picture. And I think that will probably happen, or what will probably happen, I should say, is that we'll have another feature motion picture after that and another one after that. And if they keep the quality up, then we'll all be happy to do it. Huh. In 1976... You know, when, when Roddenberry is trying to get the God thing through to, you know, the execs, he's sitting here saying, yeah, we'll probably do a feature and then we'll do another feature and then we'll do another feature. <laughs> Jeez. That was um, e- either very insightful or very hopeful. I don't know which. Now, at that point, had he had he signed? I forget. I, th- I think they probably had at that point. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, on needing the original cast in some Star Trek project, he said, yes, the fans really insist on that. That's one of the facts that made our show great. We were lucky in the casting. He was already having this feud with Shatner. He wasn't crazy about Shatner, but he, but he was a big enough person to say, we were lucky. We were lucky to have that cast because that's what made the show work. I thought right. that was good. You know, what really is neat about this interview, if you haven't seen it and you like uh, Jimmy Duhan and, and Mr. Scott, is that his pride for Star Trek really comes through. You know, he talks about it in a really caring way. He's he's proud of this show. He's proud of the role. It is evident. And so it's really neat to see it. On residual payments, uh, Jimmy Duhan says, the cast hasn't been paid for reruns in over five years. <laughs> <laughs> this was 1976. So clearly, after a year and a half or two years, they weren't getting paid bud kiss. <laughs> so think about all the money by 75 and 76 when Star Trek and reruns is really going crazy. Think about all the residual payments these guys did not get. It's a lot of money. It's almost a crime. And, and Paramount has admitted, yeah, we were making money in the 70s. Oh, yeah, it worked. In, uh, in 1976, the space shuttle Enterprise is unveiled, and uh, Jimmy Duhan is there with a lot of the other crew members uh, to celebrate that fact. Very cool. In 1978, he's involved with a Saturday morning live action show called Jason of Star Command, <laughs> and he played Commander Carnarvon. This was, interestingly, this is a filmation project, 
by the same company that produced the animated series. Interesting. Yeah. So he was on Saturday morning for a while in live action. And I kind of sort of uh, remember that. I watched an episode um, in preparation for this show, uh, and I sort of remembered it. They are dressed a lot like the Rebels in Star Wars. A lot like Star Wars. In, uh, in 1978, he suffers a massive heart attack. He was a guy, <laughs> from what I read, who liked to drink, liked to eat, and wasn't going to change. And uh, un- unfortunately had a massive heart attack be- be, uh, because of that. And of course, in 1979, then, he's working on Star Trek, the motion picture. Um, that's a light acting resume when you compare it to Shatner or Nimoy in the 70s. And again, he admits he's typecast. But he was able to support his family through personal appearances, And uh, he is one of the few Trek actors who really liked meeting the fans and talking with them. He loved telling stories to the fans. He loved going to conventions. Yeah, he is. He's got that that Irish storyteller in him. When you see interviews with him, he's always got a smile on his face. He always looks like he's having a good time and he's always happy to tell a story. That's just who Jimmy Doohan is. This is here uh, is a little fact I didn't know. He's credited with developing the early stages of both the Klingon and Vulcan languages yes. for the motion picture. Yes. There's an author who uh, wrote a book later on who kind of gets all of, the, uh, all of the credit, but it was actually Dim- Jimmy Doohan who came up with those early pieces for it. His career through the 80s, that's pretty easy. We know what that was uh, into the 90s. At the age of 80, in 2000, he and his wife, Wendy, had a daughter. Go, Jimmy, go. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Good for him. Good for him. He received a star on the Walk of uh, Fame in Hollywood in 2004. Unfortunately, in 2004, he was also diagnosed with Alzheimer's and uh, sort of made an announcement that he was going to um, and his, uh, his public life, his celebrity life. He ended up dying July 20th, 2005, which was the 36th anniversary of the first moon landing. And he died of uh, pulmonary fibrosis, but he was also, as I said, suffering from Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. He was not a well man. But here's a nice little tribute. After, after he, he died, he was cremated, and a small portion of his ashes in 2007 went into orbit. So that's sort of a nice tribute for him. Yeah, and definitely will be missed. So can I add just one little tidbit here? Absolutely. Talk, talk about his family. Sure. So his two, his two sons, Montgomery and Christopher, they both appeared in the motion picture. Um, Star Trek: The Motion Picture in '79. Were they in the uh, in the scene uh, where the whole crew is on the deck? Yes. Yeah. There's um, several people that appeared in that, but that's neat that he was able to get his sons into that. Yep. He was all. Christopher was in JJ's reboot in yep. 2009, and um, Christopher also got a accredited cameo in the transporter room for Into Darkness. Uh, and, he also, Chris, uh, Christopher, plays Scotty in the award-winning web series, Star yep. Trek Continues. Yes, I was going to bring that up, but I'm glad you did. Yes, he uh, and he looks a lot like his dad, too, in that. So He does. It's very cool for Chris Duhan to be able to play uh, the role his father made famous. Next week, hope you join us. We'll be talking about Star Trek, the animated series. Thanks for listening to 70s Trek, an independent fan production. Join us next week as we explore more about the production, the actors, the producers, and the influencers of Star Trek in the lost decade of the 1970s on 70s Trek.